Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome, everybody. I'm Mike Lehman. I'm the director of the Brain Health Research uh, Institute at uh, Kent State. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to a celebration of the Brain Health Research Institute's new space over in the Integrated Sciences Building. And it's my great, great pleasure to tell you that to kick off this event, uh, I'm here to introduce a keynote speaker for us, uh, Earl Miller uh, from uh, MIT, who's a Kent State alum and a world leader in the study of neurocognitive function. Uh, Earl is the Pickhauer Professor of Neuroscience at the Pickhauer Institute for Learning and Memory and Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. Uh, Earl's lab has made fundamental discoveries about neural circuits, networks, and mechanisms by which the brain and the prefrontal cortex specifically wields executive control, including functions like memory, attention, decision-making, and learning, and how neural oscillations regulate neural communication and, in fact, consciousness. His researchers have provided insights into how the normal brain produces thought, as well as dysfunction in diseases such as autism, schizophrenia, and attention deficit disorder. So a very quick um, bio of, of Earl's uh, history. I'll be mercifully quick. Uh, Earl was born in Columbus. He grew up in Lyndhurst, mm -hmm. uh, close to, uh, to, to Cleveland. Um, he's a Kent alum, as I mentioned. He got his BA with honors in psychology uh, right here. Uh, he then went to uh, Princeton, thanks to efforts of Dave Riccio. Uh, he uh, ended up at Princeton, got his master's and then PhD in psychology and neuroscience, and then after that did a postdoc uh, in the laboratory of neuropsychology at NIMH. Earl is the recipient of a variety of awards and honors, including the election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and more recently receiving the George Miller Prize in Cognitive Neuroscience. Uh, he also serves as editor on multiple editorial boards, major journals in neuroscience, and international advisory boards. Uh, Earl has 157 publications, <laughs> including many publications on very high impact journals, Neuron, PNAS, eLife, Nature Communications, uh, and over 30,000 uh, citations of that work, including a landmark paper that he published with Jonathan Cohen in 2001 uh, called An Integrative Theory of Pre Prefrontal Cortex Function uh, that is identified as the fifth most cited paper in neuroscience. I'm sure he's tired of hearing uh, that in no. introductions. No? Okay, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep going on. <laughs> he's also received awards here at, at Kent State. Uh, he gave a commencement address in 2016 and he received the honorary degree of Doctor of Science uh, here in 2020. Uh, and uh, just in case you're, 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 uh, you're thinking this is all about uh, uh, Earl's uh, career, uh, he also is a talented musician. He has a band uh, called What She Said in, in, uh, in the Boston area in Summer, Somerville. Uh, and uh, this is Earl when he's not doing groundbreaking science. He's playing, I think it's a P bass, right? Yeah. Right there. Yeah. And, uh, and again, just, so, just in case you're thinking, well, how unusual is this to find a great neuroscientist who's also a bass guitarist? Well, um, here's another one. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is me as a graduate student in Ann Arbor. Uh, albeit, this is 40 years earlier. Uh, and again, it's uh, Michigan, not Massachusetts. But we have, we have at least that in common. And you're playing a Rick. And I'm playing a Rickenbacker. You're playing a, a Fender, Fender Precision bass. So I'm really pleased to have um, both Earl and, and Marlene here uh, today with us. Uh, and I'm going to invite Earl to come on up and give his talk, which is entitled One Journey uh, from 20th to 21st Century Neuroscience. Thank you, Earl. Please. Thank you, Mike. Well, Mike, thanks for that. Great introduction, great generous introduction. And thank you also for inviting me to speak here today. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here. Um, I became a neuroscientist at Kent State, and now to be invited back on the occasion of the opening of the Brain Health Research Institute is really one of the great thrills and honors of my life. Now, you may wonder who I am and what I do. Mike gave you a little bit of an outline there. Our lab studies executive brain functions. These are the brain functions involved in doing things like planning, focusing attention, learning and rules, organizing thoughts, making decisions. And we study them by recording the electrical activity from the brains of animals and humans 
And we use computational modeling and analytics to understand, make sense of these signals. You do a lot, throw a lot of math at these signals to understand them. Now, why do we do this? Well, we want to figure out how the brain works. And that's nice. That's really cool. We want to figure out how cognition works. So that's a lot of fun. But most importantly, we want to understand cognitive dysfunction in disease like autism, schizophrenia, attention deficit disorder, so we could begin to open up new paths to therapies and treatment. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research today, but I thought on this particular occasion, I should put it in, maybe put it in a broader context, because if you want to know where neuroscience is now in the 21st century and where it's going, it's really useful to know where it came from. And our thinking about the brain has changed dramatically in the past 35 years since I was a graduate student, since an undergraduate here at Kent State. So how did we used to think about the brain? Well, way back in the 20th century, we used to think about the brain as kind of being like clockwork. It was a collection of specialized parts, and the parts were like gears. And each one of these gears, each one of these parts had one specific function. So here's our gears. They're neurons, brain cells. Your, your brain has um, hundreds of millions of these brain cells, neurons. And they're the basic building block of your brain. And they signal one another by giving off electrical impulses, something we call spikes. Now, why do we think each one of these neurons had one particular function? It's because of work like this. This is from the Nobel Prize winning work of David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. And what they did is they studied electrical impulses, spikes, from neurons at the back of the brain called primary visual cortex. Primary visual cortex is one of the early stages of visual processing. And at the time, this is back in 1962, we knew that it was important for vision, but no one knew how it did vision. So Hubel and Wiesel recorded these impulses, these spikes from, from individual neurons in the back of the brain. They made a remarkable discovery. And that is, individual neurons were activated by low-level features like bars of light. So for example, this neuron here is an oscilloscope screen, so you can see the little spikes going off. This neuron is activated whenever the animal is looking at this, at this screen containing a bar of light leaning to the left, and a bar of light at that particular location. Other neurons, there's lots of neurons back there, other neurons would be activated by another bar of light in another orientation or in another location. So the idea here, that this neuron has one particular function, this one particular neuron detecting that bar at that location, that bar of light or that edge, and that neurons in primary visual cortex break down a visual scene into a bunch of low-level features, like edges and bars. Okay, so this was a powerful way of first beginning to understand the brain. And the other thing is that uh, we thought that the brain interacted via physical connection. So just like gears in a clock, these neurons work together by being physically wired together, just like gears meshing together. And this is how we thought the brain works, is that you take neurons that each do one particular function, and they combine their signals when you wire them together. So for example, here's our bars of light. Here at the back of the brain, neurons detect these bars of light. Maybe the next stage of visual processing would wire together, combine a couple of these uh, sig signals from a couple of uh, these neurons, and you get longer bars of light. Then you combine more neurons. Next stage, you combine some signals from these neurons, and then you get things like corners and edges. And you keep combining, combining, combining until you get the more complex shapes like these, and there's hundreds of millions of neuron in your, neurons in your brain, so you keep wiring these sig these signals keep combining by virtue of the wiring, and eventually you get to something like peace, love, and understanding. So why do we think that way about the brain? Why do we think the brain worked in such a clockwork fashion where every brain cell had one function and they worked by virtue of the fact that they were physically wired together? Well, first of all, the clockwork paradigm is not wrong. Different parts of your brain do do different things. It's, it's still correct to a certain level of understanding. But most importantly, the clockwork paradigm was foundational. It was a necessary stepping stone. If you want to figure out how something as complex as the brain works, first you have to figure out the parts, then you can put the parts together. Okay, so in order to get to the way we think about the brain now, this clockwork-like paradigm, piecemeal paradigm, was a necessary precursor. Now, as always in science, limitations in technology limit our scope. 
There's a bit of a streetlight effect going on in science. This is the streetlight effect. This is the proverbial drunk looking for their keys under the streetlight because the light's better there, not because they lost the keys there. And the fact of the matter is science can really only talk about, study, think about what we can actually measure. So what were those limitations? Well, back in the 20th century and today, we have cellular molecular biology. This deals with how individual neurons grow and how neurons, individual neurons are wired together. And we also had, and still have, neuroanatomy and neuropsychology. This deals with what are the major structures of the brain, what's the gross anatomy of the brain, and how are they wired together. So the way to think about this is that molecular biology deals with how the local streets are constructed and how the streets line up together. And neuroanatomy and neuropsychology is more like what are the cities and major highways connecting them in the brain. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, we had cognitive science, psychology, artificial intelligence, behavioral science. These are principles of how the whole mind works, how the whole brain works together, the functions of the whole brain, one of the principles by which it operates. The question is, so we had studies of structure, structure of the brain, and studies of function writ large. So how do you bridge this gap between details of the structure of the brain and the gross anatomy to how the brain actually functions? Well, what you do is you figure out what the gears do, just like Hubel and Wiesel did. You figure out, you, you record these impulses from individual neurons, you figure out what activates the neurons, you figure out their function, and if you figure out how all the neurons are wired together and do this combinatorial process, you will eventually figure out the whole brain. Now, you, you may ask, we, what, what has changed since then? I mean, we, we, uh, obviously, we don't think about the brain. We think about the brain in a more holistic fashion these days, in a less of a piecemeal fashion. What changed? Well, first of all, before I get to that, sorry, we, we, um, we had a big limitation in this particular technology, in this recording, these, figuring out what the individual gears and neurons do. And that limitation was technology limited us to studying the brain just from one neuron at a time. So here was state of the art of 20th century neuroscience, recording electrical activity spikes from a single neuron using a single electrode. This is what I did for a couple decades. These are, here's four neurons here. And the way this worked is you would take a microelectrode, this is a metal electrode that can um, pick up on uh, electrical signals from the brain, and you drive it down until the electrode is near one neuron. Then you might spend a, a few hours or even a whole day just studying what that one neuron did. And then next day you might study another neuron. So for a long time, we thought about the brain like clockwork because we only could study it piece by piece, one neuron at a time. But now we study the brain in this more holistic fashion. I'll get to what I mean by that in a moment. But you may ask, what changed? Well, what changed was, first of all, the clockwork paradigm was a big success. We learned a lot about how the brain works. But as we learned more and more, we also began to run into limitations. We began to hit a conceptual wall. The clockwork paradigm explained a lot about the brain, but there was a lot of stuff it couldn't explain. So we had that conceptual wall that we ran into. But advances in technology also invented the scope of what we could investigate. So for example, one recent development over the past 30 years was the advancement of studies of uh, using multiple electrode recording, where now you're not just recording from one neuron at a time with a single microelectrode. Now can we, we can record from hundreds or thousands of neurons at a time using dozens or hundreds or even thousands of, of electrodes. So we greatly expanded our scope of what we could study. And this is an example here of calcium imaging. Here's a population of thousands of neurons, and they're twinkling on and off. Each one of those um, bits of a twinkling is, is a neuron giving off one of these spikes or action potentials. Now, another development was the rise of cellular and, and genetic tech tools, genetic tools that allowed us to turn on and off neurons in the brain and actually turn on and off circuits in the functioning brain. So there's a recent development called optogenetics. Optogenetics is you take a virus and you can affect certain groups of cells in the brain, certain types of cells in the brain. Then by shining light on the brain, you can actually turn these neurons on and off as the brain is actually working and the animal is actually doing something. So for the first time ever, instead of studying the brain one piece at a time, we now could watch whole networks work together, thousands, hundreds and thousands of neurons working together, and we could actually manipulate these networks. The other thing that happened was a rise in something called computational neuroscience. These signals from hundreds and thousands of neurons can, can get to be quite complex. 
and a whole a field of uh, computational neuroscience arose up to develop mathematical models and analytical techniques to understand these, these complex network-like interactions. And as a result, we're now in the 21st century, we more focus on emergent properties, properties and mechanisms that emerge only when you watch all the parts work together. And I'll get to give you, show you an example of that in a, in a few minutes. But before I do, I want to introduce one more concept to you, and that is the concept of paradigm shifts. Thomas Kuhn pointed out that science doesn't advance in a linear and continuous way. We have a certain way of thinking, then there's a shift to a new way of thinking. So for example, we have a, our clockwork paradigm, and that works for a long time. We learn a lot new about the brain. We're doing really well. And then we start reaching limitations. Science goes into a crisis mode. We start reaching limitations. And people start suggesting, well, maybe there's another way to look at things. And since science is done by people, you know, some people resist the, uh, the shift. But eventually, there's a little bit of drama. And then you, we shift to a brand new way of looking. So you may ask yourself, you know, why is it? I mean, uh, why does why doesn't science proceed in a continuous linear fashion? Why is it done in these in these periodic uh, shifts? It's because science is done by people. People are skeptical of new ideas; it doesn't seem to fit the way we think, and rightly so, because you can't just accept any new idea the moment it comes along. Ideas need time to prove themselves. But the other thing is that people tend to defend the old paradigm. Scientists are invested in a certain way of thinking; they spend years working under that paradigm. And when something new comes along, they, they're a little bit resistant to just give up what they, what, what they already know and switch to something new. We're not perfect. But we get over that, and science does proceed in, in, the, in these paradigm shifts. It advances in these paradigm shifts. Now, my career, lucky me, happened to straddle the paradigm shift from this clockwork-like paradigm to the one of now where we're focusing on more holistic views of the brain and emergent properties. So in this talk, I'm going to just give you some samples of my lab's work as seen through the lens of this paradigm shift. But a couple points I want to make first. One is that all paradigms are stepping stones. The clockwork-like paradigm is still correct to a certain degree, but importantly, it was a stepping stone to get to where we are now. But one day, we'll shift to a new paradigm, and this emergent property paradigm will also be a stepping stone to, to where, where we're going. We don't know what that is yet, but eventually we'll, there will be a paradigm shift, and this will just be a stepping stone as well. And the other thing is that I want to make clear, our lab is not, I don't want to give you the impression that our lab was alone, not by a long shot, in making this paradigm shift come along. It takes a group to make a paradigm shift. If we were the only ones talking about this stuff, we'd be considered crackpots, right? Instead, what happens is there's a small cohort of people who begin to introduce a new paradigm, a new way of thinking. And then as you accumulate evidence, that cohort grows and grows until the field shifts over. So with that in mind, let's start with a study that my lab did um, uh, 20 years ago or so. And we asked the question, how does the brain make categories and concepts? So as I mentioned, we already knew from prior work, like Hubel and Wiesel and other pioneers, that the, how, the, how the nuts and bolts of sensation work. Like vision is broken down. Your brain breaks down vision, uh, the seed, into a bunch of small, low-level features like bars and edges. But it seemed like a big leap to get from bars of light to abstract categories. How, that seemed like a really, really real jump, and no one had shown that, how you get from one to the other. So um, now we didn't want to start with things like peace, love, and understanding, so we started a little more modestly. We trained monkeys to categorize a bunch of images as two visual shape categories, cat versus dog. And here's the way we set up this particular experiment. We took images of three prototype cats, this is a house cat, a cheetah, and a mountain lion, and three prototype dogs, and we used this morphing algorithm developed in Tommy Poggio's lab at MIT to morph or blend all possible combinations of the three cats and the three dogs, and we could generate dozens and dozens, hundreds of images. This shows just a few of them. If you look here, this cat is gradually becoming this dog as we blend in more and more of the dog to the cat, and this dog is gradually becoming this cat. Now, our monkeys did not know. We wanted to train them that some of these things were cats and some of them were dogs. We, uh, so we trained them to do so. And we decided that at, what we would do is we would study the prefrontal cortex because the prefrontal cortex is the, it's the brain's executive. 
It's where the highest level of thinking goes on in your brain. It's where the brain acquires its high level knowledge so it can exert top down executive control and tell the rest of the brain what to do. So we thought it'd be a good place to look for where the brain pulls, learns categories and concepts. Now, if you would record, if you record from the prefrontal cortex before the, or anywhere in cortex before the animal actually learned which of these things are cats and which ones are dogs, what you would find is you would find different neurons that are activated by different, different images. For one neuron, for example, might be activated by this particular image here because it contains some bar of light or some edge, some low-level feature that happened to activate that particular neuron. Another neuron may be activated by this image because it contains some other low-level feature, like an edge or something that activates that neuron. But what we did is we trained our animals that there was a sharp boundary that didn't actually exist in the real world. This is a continuous, smoothly varying shape space. We drew a boundary at the 50-50 line and we taught our monkeys over the course of a few, several weeks or a couple months that all the things on this side of the line, all the things that were more than 50% cat were the same thing, cat. And all these things on the other side of the line, they were the same thing, dog. Now you could draw this boundary anywhere and we have and you get the same result. And that result is after several weeks of a training, is that after we train the animals to recognize these things as not separate images, but all, the, all these different things are one thing, cat, and all these different things are one thing, dog, we now found that all the neurons in the prefrontal cortex that we encountered, they were activated, they showed these spikes, not to the individual image, but to the categories. So one neuron would, would, might activate to any one of these images, as long as, it was, as long as the animal learned it was a cat, and other neurons might activate to any of these images as long as they learned that that image was a dog. So essentially what the prefrontal cortex did, it threw away all the details, all the unnecessary details, and extracted the high level information the animal needed to solve the task, the category of cat versus dog. Now we wanted to see if this is a general principle of, how, of what the prefrontal cortex does in brain function. So after training our animals to do cats and dogs, we also train the animals to recognize small numbers, one through five. And we train them on even abstract principles like same versus different or up versus down. And all these studies pointed to the same result, that the role of the prefrontal cortex, the brain's executive, what it does is extra it extracts the essence from experience. It gets the big picture information needed, the high level information needed to be the executive, needed to exert top down control and tell the rest of the brain what, what to do. So that's all well and fine so far, and this is all very consistent with the clockwork like paradigm. Because you know, if you, you start at the back of the brain, primary visual cortex with these neurons that will respond to low level features like bars of light. You have a lot of neurons in your brain, you combine their signals, you combine their signals, and eventually you'll get to, whoops, something like a, you'll, get the, you'll, get to the, you'll get the cat. You just gotta combine enough neurons. So, so far that's fine, it was fine with the clockwork paradigm. But here's where it gets all paradigm shifty. We, unlike previous work, we, we didn't record from single neurons in a single lecture. Our laboratory de helped develop this new technology to record from hundreds of neurons simultaneously. So we could record from large volumes of neurons, 10, 100 times more than previous studies. And that revealed something we didn't expect, something that was very surprising, that nearly 30 to 40% of the neurons in higher cortical areas like the prefrontal cortex nearly half of the neurons in the brain were doing just what we trained the animal to do, cats versus dogs. And it's, it's like the task just took over the animal's brain. Now that was a problem with the clockwork, for the clockwork paradigm, because the clockwork paradigm paints a very different picture. There should be a bunch of neurons, maybe in primary visual cortex, or definitely in primary visual cortex, that respond to low level features, and there'll be a bunch of intermediate neurons that respond to combinations of those features, and eventually you'll get to a few neurons that will do cat or dog. The clockwork paradigm couldn't explain why so many neurons, 30 to 40% of the neurons, were doing just the thing we trained the animal to do and doing nothing else, apparently. So when we first presented this work, we were presented with a little bit of skepticism. Rightly so, it was a brand new study and it yielded something we didn't expect. And here's where kind of the, the shift, paradigm shifty drama comes in. We got a lot of resistance from people. Uh, we got, someone said to us, uh, what are you telling me? The, you can just learn two or three things and your whole brain fills up? I mean, that wasn't a serious question. It was a way of a person saying, this is impossible. There's no way this result can be right. Or we were told, maybe this is just abnormal. 
these, these animals spent weeks or months training on, on these tasks, and maybe it just really did take over the animal's brain because it was so important to the animal. And the animal had so much experience doing this, these computer games to, that, that were there to recognize cats and dogs or whatnot. Now, I never bought that because our animals, they train for you know, a couple months, two hours a day learning, learning these games. Humans have years and years and decades of strength. I've been doing neuroscience for 35 years. Does it mean neuroscience has taken over? Well, maybe neuroscience has taken over my brain, actually. But the point is, is that this is not an abnormal amount of experience. The kind of experience the animals had in solving this task pales in comparison to the decades, years of experience that we carry around in our heads. Now, another explanation was maybe we were kind of stupid. We, I was, a senior investigator suggested to me that, you know, maybe you're just not trying hard enough. If you go back into your laboratory and try harder, you'll figure out what these neurons are actually doing instead of what you think they're doing. But I'm happy to say that whole body of work I presented to you, uh, we kept coming up with the same result over and over again. And other people doing work, they followed suit. You know, they, uh, we weren't the only ones doing this work, and they were coming up with the same answer too. Large volumes of neurons doing the task that, that the animal was trained to do. And what the answer that we finally came up with through further experimentation is that the clockwork-like paradigm is not right, not completely. Cortical neurons are not like fixed gears. Co neurons in the cortex don't do, do, just do one thing. They're multifunctional. They're like utility players on a baseball team. They can take different positions as needed. And we've shown this. We've trained animals on multiple tasks, and you see the neuron doing different things, one neuron doing different things in different tasks. Neurons truly were multifunctional. And that solves this problem because it now wasn't a big deal that 40% of the neurons were doing cat or dog or number or same or different. Because that wasn't a big deal because they could do other things too. Now, when John Duncan and I first suggested this back about 20 years ago, again, we got some skepticism. We were accused of turning the cortex into a bowl of porridge or just muddying the waters, confusing things. But we, we did more and more work. Other people did work. and we. Results speak volumes, and, and this result can just be explained away. So there was some gradual acceptance of this idea of neurons, especially in cortex, being multifunctional, being like utility players. But what really nailed it, I think what really nailed it, what really flipped it over to um, wide acceptance is my colleagues at Columbia, Stefano Fusi and Mati Arigata, they showed mathematically that your brain needs multifunctional neurons to do anything complicated. It, it provides, multifunctional neurons provide the horsepower your brain needs to do high level cognitive functions. And I'll spare you all the math, but the idea here is that these multifunctional neurons are like a neural bazaar where a wide range of information can interact. All this information is there available in the same population of neurons. It can, be, it can be grabbed as needed. It also make, it makes the brain smarter for that reason. All this information is at the brain's fingertips, if you will. And for mathy reasons, which I won't bore you with, it also increases the storage capacity of the brain. If you have enough of these multifunctional neurons, your brain becomes capacity unlimited. It can store an unlimited amount of information. And because of all, all that information was in this neural bazaar, in, in these uh, 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 multifunctionality, the brain could learn things quickly, and your brain could be flexible. You can do different things because there's so much information available to the same network of neurons engage in a wide variety of behaviors. So this body of work from, from my uh, Columbia University colleagues and my, my, my student, Melissa, Melissa Ward, I think this, now we're safe, to, I think it's safe to say this idea of multifunctional neurons is, is widely accepted. But this led to another problem, the clockwork paradigm. Namely that multifunctionality obviously means that neurons change their function. And that doesn't fit with the clockwork paradigm because the clock, in the clockwork paradigm, brain anatomy is destiny. Neurons do what they do because they're physically wired together. They combine their signals because they have a physical connection. So that's the idea here is you have this combinatorial process where neurons do what they do because they, 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 they share a physical connection. They're actually physically connected. In fact, it used to be thought that every perception thought or action you have in your brain. Every memory, every perception, everything you think of has a unique network of neurons, a physically unique network of neurons that we call ensembles. And this is how that works. The idea was that if you have one thought, there's our blue network here, we'll call this the blue network underlies the concept of cat. And the red network here maybe underlies the concept of dog. And the idea is that they're actually physically separate networks. And they must be because if you have a thought 
cat that's separate from the thought dog, and the anatomy is everything in the brain, there must be a separate anatomically separate network that corresponds to that particular concept or memory or anything. Now, what multifunctionality means is that your brain doesn't work like this. You don't have separate networks for every thought you have, separate networks that are wired independently of one another. Rather, it's more like this. I'm sorry, this is not showing up very well. But here is our, our two networks now, red and blue. And rather than being separate, they're actually, they share a lot of common elements. So here there's these um, multifunctional neurons that are shown here in this blue shade or purple shade. And these multifunctional neurons are part of both networks, both the red and blue network. Now these are just two networks. You're in the brain, actually, there'd be dozens and dozens of networks all, all intermeshed on top of one another. And that's, that's the way that multifunctionality must work because if, if the neuron can do, these multifunctional neurons can do a bunch of different things, they must participate in a bunch of different networks. But if anatomy is destiny, the brain works by virtue of how the brain, how neurons are wired together, how does this work? Let's say I want to think the concept of dog and activate the blue network. If anatomy is everything, well, if I try to activate the blue network here, the activity will run over to the red network, and you have both networks activated, and now my thoughts are a mush. So anatomy can't be everything in the brain. It can't be destiny. It can't be the only thing that drives function in the brain. So how does it work? Well, the answer, after much work, came to us and suggested that the answer is brain waves. Now, you guys probably all know what brain waves are. If you stick a bunch of electrodes on your scalp, and you, you get these squiggly lines on, on, a, on a screen. And what they are, are millions of neurons activating together in, in a synchronized way. The millions of neurons activating, giving off these impulses together. And then they're going quiet together. And this happens on a variety of time scales, anywhere from one time a second to 30 times a second, or even 100 times a second or more. Your brain is very rhythmic. It's doing these oscillatory, these oscillatory rhythms, these brain waves, at multiple time scales. So, so far, I've talked about the activity of spikes of individual neurons. These are voices, individual voices in a very large crowd. Brain waves are an emergent property. They're a property of crowds of millions of neurons activating together. So here's a crowd doing the wave. The wave is going from left to right. Let's say I wanted to study the brain by using a single micro, micro electrode or a single microphone to study this crowd, the brain, one person at a time. I could hear what individuals in, the, in this crowd are talking about one at a time, but I would have no idea this wave is going on. I only could see this wave by considering all of them acting together at the same time, then only then can I see this emergent property, this, this overarching structure. And because the focus in the 20th century was on individual neurons and what they do, brain waves are often dismissed as being diagnostic, like the humming of a car engine. Like the engine, you could tell the engine's running because it's humming. You could tell how fast the engine's running when it hums faster. But humming doesn't make the engine run. And that's the way people dismissed this idea of brainwaves back, back when we, the focus was on properties of single neurons and pieces of the brain. But now, we've begun to learn that your brain is actually more like FM radio. That brainwaves are actually a backbone of communication in the brain, an important backbone of communication. And here's how this works. Networks form when neurons, when neurons that form the network begin to synchronize their rhythms. Neurons that hum together, in other words, temporarily wire together. So here's our red and our blue network. Think of them as um, they're sitting in the stands together and the grandstand together, they're all intermixed in the same crowd. But you can tell the red network from the blue network because they're each doing their own wave. Okay. So they may be physically mixed, intermixed together, but because each, each group, each subgroup is doing a different wave, you can tell one group from the other. And what this buys the brain is flexibility. Because people can learn new things, we can learn new things really, really quickly, and we can uh, change our thoughts from moment to moment, literally from second to second. And it, that can't be explained by anatomy alone. Because you're, it takes time to wire your brain. It takes a lot of experience and time to wire your brain. Your brain can't rewire itself constantly on a second to second time scale. But if networks actually form in the brain, brain not by having them to be fit only physically connected, but by, by these shifting patterns of brain waves, well, then you can quickly shift 
which networks are activated, which form networks, unformed networks, break them apart, reform them all by shifting patterns in brain waves. It endows the, the brain with the kind of flexibility it needs to do high level cognitive functions. So the way to think about this is brain anatomy is not destiny, it's possibility. Brain anatomy is like the road and highway system. It says where traffic could go, not where it does go from moment to moment. Brainwave patterns are what directs the traffic. Brainwave patterns are what directs the traffic on the flow of the, of the road and highway system of the brain's anatomy. Now earlier, I showed you examples of spikes from individual neurons that signaled cat or dog or other concepts. When we looked for these categories and concepts, on this higher level, on this emergent property level, we found them. We found that different patterns of brainwave synchrony for different thoughts, memories, categories, and concepts. So for example, in one study, we recorded from a um, population of neurons while the animal was doing this cat-dog judgment. And we found one pattern of brainwave synchrony when the animal was recognizing a cat. And still recording from the same population of neurons, we found a different pattern of brainwave synchrony when the animal was recognizing the concept dog. So these two shifting brainwave patterns seem to shift the networks so the animal can recognize cat versus dog. And it isn't just the synchrony that's important. Your brain really is kind of like FM radio in the sense that different brainwave frequencies actually carry different types of information, like two different stations on the, on the FM dial. So we found the high, fre high, frequencies, high frequency brain waves, 30 hertz, 30 times a second brain waves, very fast brain waves, they feed forward sensory signals in your brain. So the way your brain is, is organized is the back of your brain is where, where, where sensation is analyzed. Um, sound, vision, feelings of touch. It's analyzed in the back of your brain, then it's fed forward to the executive parts of your brain, so the brain's executive, the prefrontal cortex, knows what's going on in the outside world. In turn, the prefrontal cortex the executives sends top-down control signals in the opposite direction. So it can regulate the flow of sensory signals. Your brain can't possibly process all the sensory information flowing into it. It would overwhelm the brain. So the um, prefrontal cortex sends down control signals in the opposite direction that filter out much of incoming sensory information and allow you to focus on one thing and ignore other things. And these, these, these uh, top-down executive control signals, they were carried by low frequency, below 30 hertz brain waves. And normal cognition will be a balance between these two signals. Because like I said, you can't possibly analyze, your brain can't possibly process all the sensory information coming into your brain simultaneously. It would get, get overwhelmed. So your brain uses these, these top-down executive control signals to do, do a lot of filtering. And we think the imbalance between these two types of signals, the feed forward of sensory information and the top-down control that filters them, we think that imbalance could explain the sensory overload seen in autism. Basically, the top-down control signals become weakened or the high-frequency feed forward sensory signals, they, they become strong, they overwhelm the control signals, and now you have a brain that can't filter the bulk of sensory information out, and you have a brain that's overloaded, it gets sensory overloaded. And we are working now on interventions to try to rebalance these signals to try to develop a new treatment for autism. Now we also found that sensory sequity patterns break down whenever your mind is overloaded. So to understand what I mean by that, you turn to another experiment where we taught our animals to hold two objects, pictures of two objects, and their order of appearance in mind, and something we call working memory. Working memory is the sketch pad of your conscious mind. When you're thinking conscious thoughts, it's taking place in the sketch pad of working memory. So this is the computer game we trained the animals to do. They saw two objects, this is an avocado, then an apple, then after a short one second delay, we um, show the animal three pictures and say, pick the two you saw before and get them in the right order. So the animal would pick avocado, then apple, because avocado, then apple, easy peasy. Well, what we found is that when the animal, animals were performing this task, the cortex, the prefrontal cortex, started a 30 hertz wave. The 30 hertz wave that's right at the nexus between the bottom up sensory signals and the top down control signals. This 30 hertz wave started in, in the prefrontal cortex, and 
memories of the different objects that the animal was holding in mind lined up on different parts of the wave. Essentially what your, the brain was doing was a juggling act. It was juggling the two memories 30 times a second. Object one, object two, the brain was going one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, 30 times a second. And we think this may explain one of the biggest mysteries of consciousness. Your brain can store an unlimited amount of information, a lifetime of experience, a lifetime of knowledge. But for some reason, when we start consciously thinking about things, we're very, very single-minded. The bandwidth of our mind is very, very narrow. We only can think a few thoughts at most simultaneously. And the reason is, we think, is because there's only so many balls your brain can juggle simultaneously. All the information you need for any moment of consciousness all has to fit into one of these waves. We also think it may explain how thought is ordered, or in the case of schizophrenia, disordered. So I mentioned the brain was doing this 30 hertz juggling act, one, two, one, two, one, two, 30 times a second. That wasn't quite accurate. The brain puts in a rest or a pause. What the brain was doing was going one, two, pause, one, two, pause, one, two, pause. And that pause is significant because once the pause is in there, it automatically tells the brain what the order of the thoughts are. Anything that comes right after the pause must be the first thought. Anything that comes next must be the second thought. So just putting that little pause in there automatically orders the thoughts. And shortly after we published this work, a group published a paper showing that schizophrenic patients have a decrease in 30 hertz brain waves. And we think that may explain their uh, disordered thought. And finally, I'll mention that, uh, that um, um, this, this cognitive capacity, how many mental balls your brain can juggle, it varies highly from person to person. Some people can juggle two mental balls, some people can juggle seven or eight mental balls. And I found a company called, founded a company called SplitSage where we're doing individual assessments of individual cognitive capacity so we can improve safety and performance. So for example, we're working with a major car manufacturer. They're designing heads-up displays for the windshields of their cars. The idea is that we're going to tailor these displays to individual drivers to match their cognitive profile. That way, this display will be less distracting and will improve driver safety, reduce car accidents. All right, last thing I'll tell you about is a recent experiment we did where we tried to figure out, we asked the question, why does general anesthesia cause a loss of consciousness? You may find this a little unsettling to know. Even though anesthesia has been used for over 100 years, no one really knows why it works. They just know that it does. And for a long time, it was thought that anesthesia just turns off your brain, just shuts your brain off. And that's not what actually happens. What anesthesia does is it changes your brain waves. So here's what your brain looks like. It's one of the few data slides I'm showing. This is what, what, what your brain looks like when you're awake and alert. So down here are plots of spikes. These are, again, voices of individual neurons, individual voices in a very, very large crowd. And this is something called a, a, a measure called local field potentials, which is measures of crowds of neurons activating together. So this is voices. This is a crowd sampled from all over the cortex of the brain. And these are the individual voices from the crowds. And when you're awake and alert and attentive, like hopefully now, there's a lot of high frequency chatter for various networks. You see a lot of high frequency stuff going on because these networks are forming and breaking and forming again. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of chatter in your brain. But then we anesthetized our animals with propofol, which is a common anesthesia used in humans. And we found that when the animals lost consciousness, all this high frequency chatter was replaced by a low frequency one hertz hum. And this low, this, this low frequency hum was so powerful, it knocked out all the high, it crowded out all the high frequency chatter, including all those high frequencies, 30 hertz and et cetera, that we think are crucial for, for consciousness. So that's well and fine, but now we wanted to test this further by, we asked the question, could we actually, if the animals are anesthetized, can we wake them up by reintroducing high frequencies back into the brain? And that's what we did. We used electrical stimulation to replace the high frequencies that were missing when the animal was unconscious. When we did that through high frequency electrical stimulation, the animals woke up. They regained consciousness. And we're now using these, this kind of work to develop safer methods of delivering anesthesia. So conclusions. There's been a paradigm shift from a clockwork-like view of the brain we thought about the brain one piece at a time. 
to, the, to a more integrated understanding where we understand the brain in a more holistic way. And this includes studies of emergent properties like brain waves, and they provide new insights into cognitive function and dysfunction. And this shift has gone hand in hand with changes of how we study the brain. Work used to be in different silos, molecular biology, neuroanatomy, psychology. They were in separate departments, very little crosstalk between them because there wasn't much to talk about, really. We didn't have the, the concept or the tools to start weaving the threads between these different levels of understanding the brain. But now, conceptual and especially technical advances led to interdisciplinary research that cuts across levels of understanding and weaves together. The silos are now beginning to weave together. And this is exactly what the Brain Health Research Institute is doing. I mean, look at this, look at this diversity of topic. We have cognition, metacognition, social, social behavior, studies of spinal cord injury, motor skills, these kind of this diversity of topics and investigation under one academic umbrella was unheard of when I was a student. And now it's at the forefront of where 21st century neuroscience is and where it's going. And the Brain Health Research Institute is at the absolute forefront of that, of this all important trend in neuroscience. Now also, neuroscience research has become more translational. By translational, we mean that there's been a, more of a crossover from basic research to medical practice. I showed you some examples of that from my work on anesthesia, autism, schizophrenia, even making cars safer. And the reason, there, there was this kind of translation back in the 20th century, but now it's really, really accelerated because as we're understanding more about how the brain works and we're piecing it together, piecing the parts together to see how they work, we're now, we're now, we're now learning ways, as we learn more about the brain, we're learning more on how to fix it. So this is really accelerated now in, in, in the 21st century, this, this crossover from research to, to practice. And the Brain Health Research Institute is doing exactly that, using brain health as a window into disease. This is, a, this is a theme that is of this moment in 21st century neuroscience. This is happening now, and it's happening in a big way. And it's a great theme because it's, you know, it's one thing to bring a bunch of investigators into one common department or, or center or even a room together. But it's a whole other thing to give them a theme, some threads, so they can begin to weave together dif dif disparate work and begin to find the connections between them. And brain health is, is, the, is of its moment. This is what's going on in, in, in 21st century neuroscience. And it's, it's a kind of theme that will allow this weaving together that will allow neuroscience to make great leaps and bounds and advancements to understanding the brain and in brain health. So the Brain Health Research Institute at Kent State is absolutely poised at the cutting edge of this multi-year trend, multi-decade trend in, in, a, in a neuroscience. It's at the absolute cutting edge of where neuroscience has come from and where neuroscience is going. So stay tuned for great discoveries and breakthroughs. I'm sure there's going to be many. And I congratulate Kent State on this very exciting endeavor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Earl, and thank you for closing the circle back to the Brain Health Research it's Institute in, in that way. It's a fantastic talk. Um, just let me say, um, kind of on the um, uh, connecting side to what the new space is that you're all going to look at uh, and tour later, the, uh, the lobby, the BHRA lobby, has an unusual ceiling to it, as you all see, and it's actually a ceiling that's inspired by brain waves. So I think this is a really nice way of connecting back uh, to Earl's talk. And uh, we're awfully proud of you, Earl. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any questions, please come up to the microphones. We have a couple of minutes left before we need to go over to the Integrated Science Building. Hi. Great Hi. talk. Thank um, you. Uh, great analogies. My question is with regard to Mike's intro. He mentioned that your lab might look at something related to ADHD. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if you could speak to kind of the depth with which you address schizophrenia, kind of how that relates to the ideas you presented. ADHD and schizophrenia? No, um, kind of more how ADHD intersects with, I'm guessing, maybe the brainwaves aspect or what what part of your lab looks at ADHD? Yeah, so... so um that we're, we're generally interested in these top-down executive control signals because they're, they're, they're really what's important for regulating the brain. What, what the brain's executive does is send these top-down signals that basically directs the brain what to do. 
And what does it direct the brain to do? It directs the brain to drive thought and action towards goals. And a big important part of that is attention. You need to focus on the things that are important and ignore the things that aren't important. So we're looking at the role of these top-down control signals, these, these low-frequency brain waves in attention, and how we could use things like closed-loop electrical stimulation, non-invasive stimulation, to enhance those signals when, when they appear weak, weak, and enhancing those signals. So enhancing those signals will allow the brain to better focus attention. And it's important, I mentioned closed loop. A closed loop is you actually read the signals from the brain, and then you use that to tailor the uh, electrical stimulation to match those signals. So you turn up the volume of what's, what's already there. So we think, we hope, by amplifying those top-down signals, we can strengthen the brain's ability to, to focus and maybe provide some treatment for ADHD. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, as the paradigm shift extended from cortical to subcortical structures, I wondered about this a lot because my work focuses mostly on things beneath the cortex. And yeah, that's a great question, and the answer is yes, yes, it has. It has. So we used to think about the subcortex, more primitive parts of the brain, and the cortex is do, doing different things. But we've now come to realize that the cortex isn't different from the subcortex, the more primitive parts of your brain, the cortex is like a featural add-on to your subcortex here. When we were primitive creatures, we didn't have a developed cortex. We had all these subcortical structures. You could do a lot of the things that we didn't do now, maybe not quite as elaborate or high level. We could direct our action towards goals. We'd go find food, et cetera, and so forth. And what the cortex is, we think of the cortex now as a, um, it's an add-on. It's something that was added on to these subcortical um, systems to increase the, the feature set of what the, what, the, what the brain can do. And all these places like the prefrontal cortex, they are interacting heavily with the, with the, with the, with the subcortical structures. And one great example is the top-down control signals that I just mentioned involved in ADHD. That, that does, the cortex does that along with the a subcortical structure called the thalamus. So the thalamus provides like a carrier wave, synchronizes with the cortex that allows the cortex to um, find these high frequency, higher frequency brainwave patterns and direct the top, top down signals. And that, I, I made it sound like it was all the cortex doing everything, but the cortex can't do that without these interactions with the thalamus. So yes, the cortex is something you add on to the uh, subcortex. It's not, not a, we're not dismissing it. I didn't think you were, so. Um, no, uh, once again, Earl, I want to thank you for a fantastic talk. Can you all please give him another round of applause? And I'd like, to, I'd like to invite you all to now come over to the Integrated Science Building. It's just outside there across the way. Just follow us as we walk over there. And we'll continue our, uh, our dedication of new space and, uh, and finish with tours of that new space. So please join us. <laughs>